thanks for giving us plenty of time to get to the Bible uh, passage in our Bibles as well. we pray as we come and look at this passage together. Lord, we praise you um, that you inspired this to be written, that this passage has been and I pray will be now a great comfort to your people. And we pray that we would leave changed, rejoicing, not necessarily in our circumstances, but the fact that you love us and are with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we saw how great it is being a Christian. We saw, and um, John's already uh, reminded us, that there's no condemnation from God for those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are trusting Christ. We, we saw we've been adopted into God's family, we belong to God. We see that God's spirit lives in us helping us put to death the sin in our bodies so that we can live for God. Isn't that amazing? But then the very last verse of last week's reading, I missed something out telling you about, and uh, in staff meeting on Monday, she she was like, why did you not talk about that in your sermon? I was like, yeah, because it's important. It's going to be brought up today. Verse 17 of chapter 8, if you've still got... um, your Bible's open. If we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, yes. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Christians, this side of Jesus' return, this side of heaven, have not been freed from suffering. Now, there is a sort of a a version of what's called Christianity, a false gospel, which would which would say, if you only have enough faith, if you really trust God, you you won't suffer. You'll be fine. You'll be healthy. You'll be wealthy. You'll be prosperous. The Bible says no. Paul says here, no, if you're a Christian, you will suffer. Yes, we share in Jesus' spiritual blessings, but we also share in his sufferings. Christians will suffer. And suffering is awful, isn't it? It might be physical, chronic pain. might be emotional, depression or anxiety. That's suffering. It might be coming to to terms with the death of a loved one or still missing them years later. Might be suffering abuse, feeling helpless. It might be loneliness or, or stress, always feeling tired. None of us are immune from those things, are we? Many of us have experienced those things are experiencing those things. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian if you suffer, because we're to expect to suffer as Christians. The Bible tells us that. So how is Jesus, how is the gospel that we've seen in Romans, how is that good news for sufferers? How is that good news for us if we're still going to suffer? Well, that's what we see in verse 18. Paul writes in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, Paul's not trying to minimize suffering here. He actually knows what it's like. Paul's been whipped, he's been shipwrecked, he's been attacked. He's been stoned and left for dead. He gets how serious suffering is. And yet he says our suffering is not even worth comparing to the greatness of the glory that will come. 
Yes, suffering is awful, but what lies ahead is so much better, more amazing, more glorious. It doesn't even compare. Maybe it's a bit like uh, the COVID jab, okay? A little scratch, is that what they say when you have it, have it? They used to say a little prick, they don't know how to say that anymore, are they? Just a little scratch, maybe ill for a few days. Some of you have been ill for about a few days, haven't you? If, when I have it, I'll probably faint, be unconscious for 10 minutes. Bit of suffering, yeah? But then compare that to the freedoms in the future. Imagine how much better life will be. It's COVID is, is suppressed and, and we can go about on our freedom. It's that kind of idea, but, but I mean, our sufferings are so much worse than just a little prick now, aren't they? A little, a little scratch. But the idea is compared to the glory in the future, compared to the freedom we will have in Christ in heaven. Now that's a billion times better, so much better than what we're facing now in our suffering. And then Paul goes on to explain that in more detail. In the rest of this passage, we actually see three groanings. I don't know how you groan. Three groanings in the rest of this passage. I wonder if you noticed who was doing the groaning when we had it read. In the first section, we see that creation groans. And then we say that Christians groan. And then we see that the Holy Spirit inside Christians groans. But actually all this groaning is a hopeful groaning. Not a despairing groaning. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. So first of all, we see that creation groans. Creation groans. Now we know the world is not right. It's obvious, isn't it? You don't need to... Uh, you don't need, need me to tell you that. And in this passage, that, that the, sort of, the state of our world is described as frustrated, subject to frustration, in bondage to decay, groaning in pain. That's how the world's described in Romans here. And the Bible says that's a result of the world that is cursed. It's a result of Adam and Eve's sin. It's a result of our sin. Because sin is so serious that, that it doesn't just damage us and our relationship with, with God. It has a knock-on effect to the whole world. So imagine uh, a massive asteroid was to hit Earth, okay? It's coming. Those sort of drillers, space astronauts can't stop it like they do in the films. It's coming, okay? And it's going to hit the Earth. It would destroy what it hits, but it ha would have ripple effects, wouldn't it? big dust cloud and a seismic shock and tidal waves and destruction. Well, sin is like that. Just destroy the immediate person. It, it, its destructive effects have covered the whole world. Everything is effective, affected. Work. You ever noticed how hard work is? How inefficient it is? How frustrating it is, how you can never just get done what you want to get done, how all the things just keep coming in and you keep making mistakes. That's a, a result of a, a fallen world. We live in a world where natural disasters just keep happening. We can't stop them, can we? They keep building the flood defences, the floods keep coming over them. Our bodies decay. We might be able to delay it, but we can't prevent it. Slugs eat our seedlings. And the reason we find all those things hard is because we know that's not how it should be. We know there's something wrong with our world, don't we? We know there's something wrong with death. That's why, that's why we're so sad at it. There's something wrong with work. That's why we get frustrated with it. Something wrong with our bodies. 
So we try and do all these fads and diets and exercises to try and reverse the aging. We should look at these things and say, you know what, something's gone wrong. And actually these things should bring us to seek God. C.S. Lewis wrote that suffering is God's megaphone for a deaf world. So look up and go, there must be something better. Creation grows. And notice how it grows in verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Notice this is not the groaning of a dying man. It is the groaning of a woman about to safely give birth to something wonderful. It is a hopeful groaning. Now, thankfully, I haven't got first-hand personal experience of that type of groaning. Thanks. Thank you, God. <laughs> but maybe if I were to ask my wife, if giving birth to my son Ezra was a pretty painful experience, she'd probably say yes, especially when the drugs wore off. But I imagine what kept her going, apart from me holding a hand, was the fact that it would soon be over. There was an end point, and that end point would be glorious. It's a new life, thankfully, entered the world. That joy of a new baby. And that's how creation is groaning. It's, it's a temporary groaning. It's an expectant groaning. It's a hopeful groaning. Because this creation will be restored. It will be liberated from decay. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And this new creation will be so amazing that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. Now, that's sometimes hard for us to get our heads around, isn't it? The new heaven, the new earth. Try removing all the horrible things about our world. Take all the good things. Magnify the good things a thousand times. You're somewhere not even close to how good the new creation would be when Jesus returns. The creation is groaning for that day. Bring it on, come on. Creation groans. And then we see in verse 23 that Christians groan as well. They have that same hope. So verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Another hopeful groaning. It says, if you're a Christian, you have the first fruits of the Spirit. What does that mean? Um, Rachel and I used to go for a curry to a curry house in Leicester. It actually ended up getting shut down for health and safety reasons, but um, you don't want to read the report, I tell you. But anyway, you go to this curry house, you sit, you sit down and you would order your food. And what they do, I'd never come across this before, before they gave you the main course, they'd um, put a little bit of it in a little bowl, just a mouthful, and they'd bring it out to you. So you can have a taste of what you're about to eat. You've got like the first fruits, the first experience of it. And I think you could say if it was spice, too spicy or not enough spice in it. But, but the idea was you'd have this first mouthful and you're anticipating the rest of the curry to come. Oh, I can't wait for the rest of that curry with all the rat poo that's in it and things like that. Well, God's Spirit gives Christians a foretaste, a mouthful of what's to come in the glorious future. 
So as Christians, we've got God's spirit. We, we have the reality and the experience of being part of God's family, belonging to God. We can turn to him in prayer. We can hear from him in the Bible. We can know he's with us. That's that, just that first mouthful. But it's a foretaste of that glorious future when we will be fully adopted. We will receive that inheritance of being a son or daughter of God. We're to anticipate that day where we'll fully experience being in God's family together in heaven. Or, or, or God's spirit is inside Christians, isn't he? Giving us spiritual life, helping us make progress against sin. How could us be holy? But that's just a small taste of what's to come. Because when Jesus returns, our bodies will be redeemed or we will be given perfect bodies. The battle with sin will be over. We won't even be able to sin anymore. Can you see that? The foretaste of, of the glory to come. <coughs> And so we grow, yes, we groan in our battle against sin. We grow in a broken world. We grow that we can't always fully experience God as we'd like. And we struggle in our faith and we often doubt. We grow in hope, in certain hope of the new heaven and the new earth. How do we wait? Verse 25. If we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. It is a patient groaning. Can I just ask you at this stage, where is your hope? Where would you say your hope is? Is it in this glorious future that God has Promise those who trust him. Because every day, the world around us is telling us to put our hope, not in this glorious future, but in the here and now. We all know the world's not as it is, not as it should be, but we're told, but if you have in the here and now, if you have your dream house, if you make the right amount of money, if you get your kids to the right school, if you find Mr. or Mrs. Wright, if you go on that brilliant holiday, if you get a good pension and retire early, that'll be brilliant. That's what you need to hope for. That's what we're taught every single day. Is put your hope in those things. Work for those things. But they're all over here and now, aren't they? They're all part of this broken world. If we're putting our hope in those things, God says, you are aiming far too low. <laughs> you are aiming far too low. All those things are decaying, frustrating. Put, aim higher. Put your hope in the future I offer. God says. Put your hope in something secure, something certain, something that can't be spoiled by a dodgy investment or poor health or falling out or, or anything. Put your hope in something far, far better, more satisfying and longer term. Put your hope in God's perfect future for you. And if you're suffering, remember that perfect future is secure. Christians groan, Christians groan, hopefully, for that future. And finally, the Spirit of God living in Christians groans. So have a look at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us 
with groans that words cannot express. Back to suffering. There might be times that you are struggling so much that you just don't have the words. It's too hard even to pray. Maybe you've been there. God says that at those times, if you're a Christian, you've got the spirit in you, the Holy Spirit, who knows your deepest emotions, who knows exactly what you're going through. The Holy Spirit prays for you. He takes your groans, he translates them into the perfect prayer and brings them to God on your behalf. And God loves to hear our prayers. He loves to answer our prayers. He loves to help us in our weakness. We are not alone. We are not unheard. And we are not unanswered. Because if we trust Jesus, the Spirit of God grows to God for us. So as we finish, let me ask you, are you prepared for suffering? I think every single one of us needs to be prepared for suffering, don't we? Because it will come. And I've noticed that suffering can have, have two effects on people, really. Sometimes it leads to people drawing away from God, maybe blaming God, rejecting God. But then I've seen other people whose suffering is just as bad, maybe even worse, and it's brought them closer to God. It's made them rely on him more. But my prayer is that as each one of us faces suffering in some form at some time, it draws us closer to God because we are not surprised that we suffer. Because we know that God is with us in suffering. And because God has that perfect future in store for us where there won't be any suffering. And it's also worth saying, isn't it, that we have a saviour, Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, who knows exactly what it's like to suffer. And it's his spirit at work in us, helping us through. And so we grow, we grow with hope, we grow, we suffer with anticipation, we wait patiently and confidently. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Let's just take a moment. Maybe you want to pray to God in the choir of your own hearts, given what we've seen. Maybe you want to cry out and draw closer to God. Maybe you don't have the words to say, but the Spirit is still at work in you. Lord, please increase our hope in the glorious future you have in store for your children. In Jesus' name, amen.